John was a busy man. John had a lot of kids, a lot of young kids, and especially as he got into this time of year in, into December, uh, he was very busy. Now, one of the things that was uh, a, a pretty a common occurrence in his home, I'm sure this doesn't happen to you, but the little kids would say, is today Christmas? Is it today? And John would say, no, Christmas is not today. It's a few weeks away. It's, it's December 5th, so Christmas is uh, a, a few days off. But being little kids uh, and not having a good sense of time, as you can imagine, it would be repeated again the next day, and they would come to John, and they would say, how about today, John, is today Christmas? And he would say, no, today's not Christmas. It's Waiting is hard, isn't it? I, I don't know too many people. It's not hard for you to wait. You don't care if Christmas is soon. You could, you could wait for Christmas for six months or nine months. Really? Wow. You are in a unique category then because most people find waiting hard. When we pull up to a game or a, a movie or a concert or some event and then see this massive line outside, it's the rare person, unlike my friend here, who says, that's awesome. I love long lines. It means it's going to take us an hour, hour and a half to get in. We have time to sit out here in the cold and, and fellowship. Most of us go, oh, no. You know? Have you had the experience of going to, uh, you're all excited about going to your favorite restaurant. You already know what you're going to order. It's your favorite place. It has the best food, and you... You pull up and the parking lot's kind of full and you're like, oh boy. And then you walk inside and there's a bunch of people standing in the lobby and then you go up to put your name in uh, for a table and you say, how long is the wait? And the lady at the desk looks at you and says, well, right now, about an hour, hour and a half before we can get you seated. It starts a conversation, Right? Usually you turn to your spouse and go, uh, do you want to wait? Should we go someplace else? I, I will tell you there are, there are places that I, I really love and I look forward to going to eat. There's not many that I'll go, hour, hour and a half? We're gone. I got to find some other place to go. For most of us, I, I don't know if you've ever, uh, I, I think the extreme example of waiting in our country is I, I haven't been there, it feels like a hundred years, and I don't know if I'll ever go there again, because I don't know if you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland, but here's what Disney World and Disneyland is. If you go there for 12 hours, you will wait for 11 hours, and all your rides combined in that whole 12 hours will fit in less than an hour. So if you love to wait in lines, you go there and make that happen most of us don't enjoy waiting. Waiting is hard. But sometimes we get excited when we're waiting for something. Sometimes waiting is okay. I, I, I feel quite confident that a lot of our young people in here are pretty excited about something coming up. What happens in 19 to 20 days from today, kids? Christmas, yeah, I knew the kids would do that. That's the time we like math, yeah? Uh, I was going to say, I, I really just want to go to like, one of my friends. Nice, and you were excited about that, weren't you? You're like, I, it's worth the wait, because that's coming up. So we, we're excited because in, depending upon when you celebrate in 19 or 20 days, something pretty exciting is coming. I will tell you, uh, in the Unverzad household right now, we, there's, a, there's a waiting that is exciting and expectant, right? Where you count down the days. For us, it's not just Christmas. It is the new year for the Unversots means more grandbabies. And they are worth the wait. Every grandbaby I have is awesome. And I got more coming in 2022. And, and it, there's an excitement about that of counting down the days Tell, tell the next one come and add to the, to the list and the blessing of that. Amen? So there are things that are worth waiting for. One of the basic truths of the Bible 
It's number 38 on our list of 101 basic truths that every Christian should know is that there is something that God tells us about that is absolutely worth waiting for. In fact, it should be a waiting of excitement. It, it should be a waiting of expectancy. It's a waiting of joy. And it's a waiting that, that we, we look to and think about all the time. So let's look what the Bible has to say. What, what should we be expectantly looking for today? It's something that's even more exciting than a Christmas present. It's something more exciting than a new grandbaby. And Isaiah tells us what it is in Isaiah chapter 9. I mean, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. You can look at that in your Bible or we can have it on the screen here. Let's listen to the Word of God, what He has to say to us this morning about what is it that we should be excited and waiting for. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Go up onto a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up and fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense comes before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and he will gently lead those that are with young. Heavenly Father, these are your words. They were words to the ancient Israelite of Isaiah's time, they were words of hope. They were words of expectancy and waiting. And they're words for us here in 221. The same words of expectancy and hope. And so, Father, speak to us today. There are absolutely things that are worth waiting for that we should reflect on and look to and remember. And we pray that you will remind us of them today or reveal them to us today or make them more precious to us today, Father, whatever we need, but help us to hear what it is you want us to hear. For we ask in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Father, let it be so. Let us hear and learn what you would have us to learn. Did you catch it? Isaiah said, I've got some good news. He said it several times. He said, I've got good news. There's something exciting about, and I want you to hear it. And here's the good news. Behold your God. Behold, God is coming is literally what Isaiah is saying. That word behold is like uh, what a herald for the king would say. That was in the days before email and cell phones. And the, the herald would go around and he'd say, hear ye, hear ye. I've got news from the king, or the king is coming. Uh, pay attention. I've got some exciting stuff to tell you. And the people would gather around. And Isaiah says here, behold, the king is coming, or the king is here. It's like, that word behold is like, ta-da! Here's the good news. God is about to visit you. God is about to come. And as we look at this passage, we realize that it's, it's relevant to this time of year. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned in the garden, when they declared independence from God and, and, and they understood sin, that it had separated them from fellowship, they brought brokenness and, and physical death and spiritual death and, and separation from all that is good into the world, God immediately came with good news. And he said, hey, I'm going to send a Savior. He said, the Savior is going to come. And he's going to redeem. He's going to make right all that has been broken. He's going to restore fellowship. He's going to forgive your sins and, and, and bring you back into a relationship with me. And then all throughout the Old Testament, God would drop little hints about that. You heard a couple of them this morning. And in Micah 5, he said, Okay, you know how you're going to know when the Savior's coming? He's going to be born in a little podunk town called Bethlehem. So tiny, you probably haven't heard of it, but that's where God is going to send the Savior. And, and he said, so when, when you hear this, 
That, that's how you're going to know it's the Messiah. He's going to come here. He said also in Scripture, he said, uh, the, the Savior is going to be born of a virgin. So when you see someone who says, I, I, I've never been with a man, I've never had relations, and yet she's having a baby. When you see a miraculous birth, like that's another sign that it's the Savior. And, and so God dropped all these things throughout the Scripture for the people to be looking for when God was going to come. Emmanuel is that name. Emmanuel is the name of God that means the God who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the of the universe, who is so far above and beyond us in his character and nature that we could not relate to him or understand him unless he would come down to our level. That's what Emmanuel means. That the God who is so far above our comprehension and understanding brought himself low, he humbled himself to become a man who could relate to who God is. And of course, who God became and is Jesus Christ, as we well know. Jesus, over and over again, would say to the people, do you want to understand what God is like? If you know me, you know the Father. To see me is to see the Father. I remember the, the one time Jesus talked about the Father so much and how he loves us and how he wants relationship with us and wants to forgive us of our sin. And he spoke of the Father so uh, glowingly and people were like, I, oh, I want to meet the Father. Is, he sounds awesome. You know, I want to meet the Father. And at one point, one of the disciples said, Jesus, any chance you could make the Father, I mean, like, could you ask him? I mean, you're his son. You know, we know you're the Savior. You know, Any chance you could ask God to kind of make an appearance? I'm paraphrasing, but so they, they go, it'd be awesome to see God right now. And Jesus makes this profound statement, right? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everything that I am, the Father is. Everything that the Father is, I am. To see me is to know the Father. To know me is to be in relationship with the Father. So Jesus was the fulfillment of this Isaiah 40 passage. That God is coming to be with us. He's coming in love. He's coming with good news. The good news is that while you are separated from God, God is sending the true lamb that will, will save you from your sins and be with him. And so in the church year, we are in a time that's called Advent. You heard some readings this morning and, we, and, and Brady said that we're in the second week of Advent. The word Advent is not a word you're going to find in the Bible. It's not a Bible word. It's actually a Latin word that means coming or arrival. We are in a time of year we are look, where we are looking forward to God's coming. When he became Emmanuel, when he came to the manger in Bethlehem, and so while the people of the Old Testament were looking forward to that, we are looking back to that time of Jesus coming. And so it's a time of excitement for, for the children of Israel. They were looking forward to like, when is God going to send the Savior? When is God going to come? We're looking for this arrival. And it was an exciting time. It's an exciting time, especially if you're in a hard time, especially if you're in slavery, especially if you're in bondage. And they went through times of bondage in Egypt and Babylonia and Assyria, and there were times where it's like, God, it, it, uh, you're still coming, right? Are you sending a Savior? And the truth of the matter was, like a lot of waiting, the time went on so long in the people's mind or opinion that a lot of them stopped paying attention to what God told them to look for. That God, they stopped paying attention to God, said, Savior or God is coming, he's coming to earth. But there's some exceptions to that, isn't there? A couple of my favorite characters in the Bible, I think of Anna. Older lady and an older gentleman, and when Jesus was brought by Mary and Joseph into the temple first time, I, I, don't know, I don't know what kind of faith they had or what kind of relationship they had with God, but their faith was so deep and so strong that somehow the Holy Spirit communicated to them and said, hey, you know the one you've been praying for? You know the one you've been waiting for and you've been excited and you've been expecting for God to send the Messiah? It's right over there. See that little baby? 
That's him. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe. And, and on two separate occasions, we see this happen with Anna and with Simeon. And, and look at that in the Gospels there. They break forth into rejoicing and they go, I cannot believe that God blessed me to meet the Messiah, to meet God in person. I've gotten to see Emmanuel, Emmanuel before I die. They said, oh, it's just, I'm so happy about this. All that, that, that has promised has happened. But that wasn't true for everybody, was it? In fact, it wasn't true for most people. Most people missed it. It reminds me a lot of the parable of the virgins. Are you familiar with that in Scripture? In, in Jesus' day, when a couple got engaged, it's a picture of marriage, and God actually compares his relationship with us to marriage. Jesus is the bridegroom, and, and we are the bride. In Jesus' day, when a, when a young couple got engaged or betrothed, what happened in that culture is the bridegroom then would go home and he would begin to build his house as part of his father's house. They lived in a compound. They lived in a community called an insula. Got a wife. She's ready to marry me. And the dad would say, well, you better have a home for her. You're not getting married until you've got a home where she can live in a bride. So the son would begin to build this house onto his father's house. Now, the way it worked in that culture is the father was the uh, general contactor, if you will, or was in charge of it. So the father said when the house was done. The son didn't get to say it, the father did. So the son would work and he'd build the walls and he'd maybe paint it and maybe furnish it and all this and he'd go, what do you think, dad? Is it done? Dad go, oh, you know, your bride's going to want a little more than that. Let's, you know, we need some furniture, get some tapestry here you missed a spot on the painting and and the son would work on the house and say is it done dad is it done and when the father would say it was done then the son could go and collect his bride and it was a huge celebration it was a huge thing he would collect his bride and the whole wedding party would be waiting for this and they would come back to the father's house and celebrate now i don't think this is going to shock you Ah, uh, when the son was done, or when the father said it was done, the son came immediately to get his bride. If it was midnight or one in the morning, and the father said, son, it's done. It's, it's ready for your bride. Do you think the bridegroom, do you think he went, oh, well, that's awesome, dad. But, you know, it's 1 a.m., her parents, a lot of, you know what? First thing tomorrow morning I'll, I'll go get her. Any of you, some of us that are older, do you remember that young love, that fresh love? Hopefully your love is still like that with your spouse where you would go, what? I'm not waiting. And so in the culture of that day, the bridegroom would come whatever time of night it was or day it was, and his best man would go, here comes the groom, the groom is coming. The wedding's going to happen. It's on. It's right now. Let's go. We're going to do this. The house is ready. In the parable of the virgins, they were the wedding party. Okay? They were the guests. They were the attendants at the wedding who were waiting for the announcement. And the Bible says that some of them kept oil in their lamps. They had an expectant waiting. They were excited. They go, we don't know when it is but we know it's going to happen. And when it happens, we want to make sure that we've got lamps and we can, if it's in the middle of the night, that we can find our way there, that we can get to this wedding. But some of them, it takes a little while to build a house, right? Some of them got bored or they thought, oh, he's been going at this for months. He's never going to finish. They let the oil run out of their lamps. It's a picture of spiritual readiness. It's a picture of faith. It's a picture of relationship with God. But some of those virgins were ready, right? And they heard the bridegroom come and he's like, two in the morning, wedding's on right now. We're going to do this. And the virgin, yes, we're going to go. So some of the attendants were there. Can you imagine that, ladies, if we put that in modern terms? What if you had your wedding all planned out and you've got all your attendants and then last minute, day of your wedding, a couple minutes before your wedding, half of them go, yeah, sorry, we sort of forgot that it was your wedding and we're not ready, we don't have any clothes, we don't need, you just go ahead without it. 
It, it is a picture of expectant waiting and, and readiness for the Lord to come. John got tired of his kids asking him every day this time of year, is it Christmas? Is today Christmas, John? Is today the day that we get a present? Is today that we get to celebrate? And so one year, John came up with a brilliant idea. John took an old wagon wheel uh, that had broken off his, his ox cart and he laid it on his side and he drilled 24 holes around the wooden rim. And he put 20 red candles in the holes and he put four white candles in the holes. And he gathered the children around. He gathered all his children, his orphan children, because John was Pastor John or Johann, as he was known in Germany. Pastor Johann Wickern, in 1839, ran an orphanage in Hamburg, Germany. To his orphan children in the ministry where he ran, Christmas Day was the most important day of the year for two reasons. Number one, they had very little. But on Christmas, John would always try to do his best to have a special meal on that day, right? So whatever it was, it was going to be the best meal they had all year. And because they were orphans and because John had a lot of them and they were very poor, John would try very hard to have a little gift for them on that day, if at all possible. They didn't get anything else. So, so Christmas to them was huge, way, way more than it is, I think, to us today. I'm not saying we don't uh, appreciate the gifts and stuff like that, but we're, we're pretty blessed. To these orphan children in, in Hamburg, Germany, it, it, that, that was the day of all days. And so John took this wagon wheel and he put 20 red candles in there and four red candles in there and he said, we're going to light one every day. He said, for the next 24 days, as you see these candles lit, the white ones are on Sunday and the red ones are on the weekdays. And when we light the last candle, it's Christmas Day. And so those kids would gather around every day and then John wanted to take advantage of this and make a teaching point. So he wound some, uh, he cut some evergreen branches and put it around the spokes of the, uh, of the wheel. And he said, you know, this wheel is a circle because it reminds us that God's love is eternal. God's love never begins and, and never ends. And he loves you kids. He wants to be a father to you and to treasure you and care for you. And he said these green branches, uh, an evergreen always stays green, doesn't it? It never dies. And God wants you to know that if you will come to him, if you'll turn to him, there's eternal life in his name. And so Pastor John Johann Wickern created the first Advent wreath. For some of you, this may be something you're familiar with. For some of you, it, it may be something you've never seen before. It's not something in the Bible, but it's something that reminds us of a great Bible truth. Over the years, other people began to adopt this. They, they downsized it and, and said, the Advent wreath is a symbol of, of what we are excitedly waiting for that God is going to fulfill his promises to be our God and, and to be with us. Not just in his first coming, but the Advent wreath reminds us that because there was a first coming, there's going to be a second coming, right? Do you remember what Jesus said on the night before he went to the cross, before he died and rose again? He said to the disciples in John 14, he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. He used wedding language. He used marriage language. He said, I'm going to my father's house to add on to his compound because I want to be your bridegroom. I want you to be my bride. And he said, if I'm going away, if, if, if I'm engaged to you and we have this relationship, that means there's going to come a day when I'm going to come back. And it might be in the middle of the night. <laughs> It might be, and Jesus said, I don't even know what it is because the Father will tell me. He said, there's going to come a day in time where the Father's going to say, okay, 
Everything is prepared. Go, go and get your bride. And, and Jesus used that language in the night before he left because when Jesus died and, and went into the ground, even though he told them, that was the reason he came, was to die for them. He said, I'm going to be like Jonah. He said, just like Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, I'm going to be three days in the ground and I'm going to rise again. I'm going to be like that serpent that Moses put in the wilderness that when the people were bitten by the poison snake, they would look to the serpent and, and there was no medicine there. there. There's no earthly reason that being bit by a poisonous snake and looking at a bronze snake on a pole should heal you except for grace and faith. Amen? Think about how ridiculous that is. Oh no, I've been bitten by a poisonous snake. Get to the doctor. Somebody suck out the venom. We got a major problem here. No, God said, yeah, don't worry about it. Just look at the, just look at the snake on the pole and you'll be fine. Do you know that people still died? People still died. The scripture tells us when we were bitten by the snake, because you know what they said? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I need to get to the hospital. I need, what, what good is going to look at a snake on a pole do for me? Well, it was grace and faith. It was belief. And Jesus said, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. And so Jesus used that wedding language to say, if I'm going away, I'm coming again. The Advent wreath is not just to remind us that Emmanuel came the first time, but you and I... Are, are in that waiting for the wedding party time. We're waiting for the feast. The son is preparing a place for all those who love him, all those who know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And he said, in a time when, you, you, it, it, if you're not ready, if you're not expectantly waiting, it's going to take you by surprise, but I'm coming back to take you home to be with me. That's what the Advent wreath reminds us of some things have been added to it over the years there, there's a lot of symbolism here it they, they typically have pine cones on them because pine cones look dead but if you plant the seed of a pine cone a new tree will come out of that it's a picture of resurrection life from seeming death there's usually a lot of red on an advent wreath in this case it's poinsettia plants or a lot of times it's red holly berries because it's a reminder that it is through the red blood of Christ shed for us that our sins are forgiven and we are given eternal life. And so John created that advent wreath and uh, German immigrants brought it over here to America. So now you know. Now you know why we have this, why we celebrate. Well, it's not something prescribed in the Bible, something we're told to do. Like many symbols, it reminds us of a great truth. Some of you may be new to this wreath with the candles. Uh, we light one each Sunday because it reminds us of hope and love and everlasting life. It reminds us that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And one of the things that's been new that's added over the years, you'll notice in the middle here, there's a big fat white candle. That's the Christ candle. We will light that at our Christmas Eve candlelight service because it reminds us that Jesus came, that Emmanuel came. But more importantly for us, it is to remember that if he came once and God kept his word, then he's coming back because that's the word that God gave. And are we? it's worth waiting for, isn't it? I didn't even give you the point of the sermon until the end. Are you ready? If you don't get anything else today, get this. Jesus is worth the wait. Amen? It may seem like it's been a long time. It may seem like he's never coming again, but Jesus said, oh, I'm worth the wait. I'm coming, and if you're waiting and looking for me, what a day that will be. I will gather you into my bosom. I will carry you. I will gently lead you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you keep your word that you came the first time to send your son Jesus to, to live a perfect life, a sinless life, to die a death that you didn't deserve, that you became sin on our behalf so that you might forgive us of our sins. And Father, we're so grateful as Jesus reminded us, if I'm going away now, you can be sure that I'm coming back. When the Father says it's time, when there's no more opportunity to share your word, when there's no more opportunity 
to spread the gospel when the father said, go get your bride. I'm just so grateful that Jesus is going to go, well, it's kind of late. Let's wait till tomorrow. No, he's going to come with the voice of the archangel. He's going to come with the shout of triumph and all those who are in Christ are going to be caught up to be with you. Father, we, we talked about waiting for earthly babies and we talked about earthly Christmas presents and this time of year reminds us that the first Christmas present was a baby. A baby born to take away our sins. And, and Father, we look forward to when you come the second time, not as Messiah, but as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Help us to be expectant. It's worth the wait. Help us to rejoice in that. Help us to spread the news while there is yet time for those who do not know that you are coming back. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.